Hello and welcome to Chili Vision. This time, budget game covers versus pesky reality. For those of you old enough to remember, your news agent or software shop would have had a rack of budget games that probably originally looked like this. This is one of the Firebird games, one of the early budget games that cost £2.50. And it was pretty innovative at the time because you had a screenshot of the actual game rather than, rather than some rather rubbish artwork. So you could see what you were getting. But it was still pretty much like traditional games had been before. Very simple instructions on the inside. Um, just telling you about, a little bit about the game. Not a lot at all there, really. Um, nice. I like those Firebird cassettes, though. You can see that there? They're quite nice. So I wasn't really buying budget games when games look like this. It was when games look like this, and this is the very actual copy of the first budget game I ever bought. Uh, th this turned up in our news agents, a rack of games, and we were faced with games like this, with this wonderful Mastertronic artwork. And this is the first budget game I ever bought. And the reason I'm talking about these games today is because back in the day when you were faced with a rack of games and very limited packaging, you, you basically chose your game from looking at the artwork. Um, that, that was the thing that made you... This, this picture on the front was what made you pick up the game. Now, of course, inside you have some very... This is a little bit creased because it, this is 30 years old. Um, you have some screenshots of the game. You have instructions in multiple languages because by then the games were going all over the world. And you've got some decent instructions there compared to the Firebird games, telling you what the game's about. I'm um, trying to hold that down so it doesn't spring open. And you've got a little bit more there, and you would study these packages. I mean, you really would, because 199 was a lot of money for, how old was I? For eight, something like that. So you really studied what you were buying. Um, and I also struggled to load this, because it was my first ever tape game as well. So... <laughs> Looked at this loading screen many, many times over many, many days before finally finding the magic combination on the tape recorder and then marking it with a biro so we knew what volume level would, level would load games. The game itself, the, the artwork jumps out at you and you think it would be something like The Sorcerer's Apprentice by Disney. I mean, it's clearly inspired by that kind of thing and sorcery as well. And it is a bit like sorcery, but it's a rather rubbish sorcery clone. So that's the pesky reality of it, because you've got this lovely artwork on the cover designed to grab your eye, and in actual fact, the game's just a little bit rubbish. The second budget game I bought a few weeks later was Molecule Man. This artwork isn't as nice, but it must have jumped out at me for some reason, because I bought it, and there's a thing on the cover there saying unique maze designer included. That probably jumped out at me. Oh, look, it's still got the price tag on it. Newsman. That is where I used to buy my games. Newsman. Um, a little bit longer tape than usual because it's got the maze designer on it. Open it up. I mean, something on here must have jumped out at me. Or the news agent didn't have many games left. And that used to be a problem as well. Probably the idea of a maze designer. And the fact it looked a bit like the Ultimate games, which I had at full price. So, um, thinking, oh, isometric. And it's got a designer. It's got screenshot the design. You could design your own Nightlaw. Design your own Alien 8. Of course, it was nothing of the sort. It was just a rubbish game um, that, again, wasn't even as good as uh, The Apprentice, really. Certainly didn't get that much gameplay. I picked a few more Mastertronic games up at random that I bought back in, or some of them I didn't buy back in the day, some of them I saw. Colony, which shows you a, a robot on the front. Looks terribly exciting. And giant ants, a bit like ant attack, something like that. Um, and it talks about on the back... It's cold, wet, and miserable. The I can't read that because the case is in the way. It's cold, wet, and miserable. The humans are complaining again. This lousy planet's occupants are still trying to chew through the fences. And it just this just jumped out at you. It, you thought it was going to be really... Um, it looked cool. Um, in actual fact, for once, the reality of what the game was describing um, matched the game itself. Again, this is my original copy. And still got the Newsman £1.99 sticker on there recorded on bass tape for quality of loading um trying to open these instructions here and look you've got decent 
again, you're getting to the stage now where budget games are more sophisticated. This is what, 87, something like that. And you've got better instructions, more detailed, and it goes over to the other side as well, tells you all about the game. This game was really good and certainly lived up to the cover for once. Um, really, really enjoyed it. It's on the Bulldog label as well. Unfortunately, my mistake was then to go and buy another Bulldog game because I thought it would be good. Um, called Invasion, which was a war game thing, which was absolutely rubbish. But we're on, while we're on Bulldog, let's mention Feud. This is a game I saw for sale, never bought, because I never saw a copy for the Amstrad. This is my MSX copy. And actually, like slightly not as nice cartoons as the earlier Mastertronic games, I don't think. Um, it gets across the message of the game. You've got two warring wizards and toads and things. It looks fun. Got some screenshots on the back. Unfortunately, this thing that used to happen with these games, where they used to put the holes in for the cassettes. Um, the You're missing a bit of the description on the back there. Um, Few does, I think, live up to its cover. We've covered it many times in this channel. And I think the artwork on the front could be a little bit nicer. But does the job. It's functional, certainly. Again, I'm picking these games at random, and I've got another Pickford game. <laughs> I think I probably have all my Pickford games on the on the MSX shelf together. Um, this is 180, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. It's a pub darts game. There's no doubt when you're looking at this cover 180 on the screenshots on the back what you are getting. It's very functional. It says eight opponents, digitized speech, two player option, live joystick control, live joystick. Um. Come on, live joystick control? Because you can have a game without live joystick control. You know, you have, you perhaps do your joystick controls a little bit earlier on, then 20 minutes later it, how it actually happens. Oh, hang on, hard driving on the C64. Yeah, well, apart from that, I mean, live joystick control. Full match play scoring, okay, a sense of humour, it has that. Superb playability, what more is there in life? Buy it, I agree, apart from the live joystick control. Um, or, oh, I think... I wonder, because some of those early darts games, they flashed different parts of the dartboard and you press fire at the right time, didn't you? Whereas this, you've got the, the hand ready to throw. So perhaps that's what they mean by live joystick control. And also, in the case, as I recall, got some nice instructions there. And it's a, it's a darts game, so it doesn't need lots of instructions, but it has them. It has full scoring tables there for all the combinations. So if you're rubbish at darts and maths, you get it all worked out for you. But half the fun with darts, I think, is working out those combinations and polishing up your your math skills. But I think that's one game where, again, it lives up to this lovely artwork on the cover. Ah, Werewolves of London. Now, my friend and I bought this independently. Me from my Amstrad, he from his C64. This is his C64 copy um, from uh, many, many years ago. So we both bought this in 1988. Of course, we've used this channel before. Superb game on the Amstrad and the C64, not so much on the Spectrum, still playable. And it was, of course, a full price game. So you'd seen this artwork in advertising CMVG as a full page advert beforehand. Um, and of course, Ariola Soft collapsed. The game never came out on full price. Then Mastertronic released it for $1.99, not $2.99. One ninety nine. So you immediately knew what this artwork was because they'd had all this publicity six months or so before, and it absolutely again lives up to it. Of course, it's full price artwork, not a budget game artwork, so it's, it looks a little bit above the usual director budget games. And the, technically speaking, this is a re-release, but of course it wasn't because it simply didn't come out at full price. And again, you got some nice screenshots in the back from the Amstrad version, shows it off. Run rampage across the rooftops, get savage in the sewers, have a hairy fit in Hyde Park, spread terror in the tube stations. Eight and nine year old, grab that certainly, and both my mate and I did this independently. Um, and yeah, brilliant game. Ah, now if Zoe Kirk Robinson's watching, hi Zoe, because it's Dr. Scrimes Spook School. Now, this is a game that I actually bought, but I took it back because I can never get it to load. And Today, I bought another copy, or this year rather, wouldn't load on my 464 Plus, will load on my 464. So I don't know if that's like slightly odd with the duplication of the game. Because it was a game I really wanted, because look at this cover. Wow. It's Bash Street Kids, it's Grange Hill, 
It's everything. And, and just, it's lovely. Look at it. Why don't, you know, this jumps off the shelf at you and says, buy me before you've even looked at the back of it. And it says uh, on the back, congratulations, you have won a unique scholarship to the world famous Dr. Scrimes Spook School. We have some nice uh, screenshots of the game. It's an Amstrad only game. Um, go inside. And, oh, it's not, uh, not duplicated onto bath tape. For a change, um, and it gives you the instructions for the no, not a lot on the inside because I've, I've when I've played this game, I had a little bit of difficulty with it. It's a graphical adventure game. Um, gives you some instructions there. Very nice though. I, I do love that artwork. It's very very good. And does the game live up to the artwork? Probably not. But it's a game I want to spend some more time with just to see if it is as good as other people say it is. Robin, the hooded man. Yeah, um, probably the fourth or fifth budget game I bought. Cynical cash in on Robin of Sherwood, the big ITV Saturday night show of the era. Look, that's Jason Connery blatantly crossed with Rambo with all the muscles. But um, yeah, I mean, if you're into Robin of Sherwood watching that on TV, then Robin Hood was a big thing at the time. So he looks at the back, platform and ladders, stereo music. Uh, by the Oliver Twins. Well, that, that's the second Oliver Twins game I bought. Doesn't shout about the digitised speech. Oh, I know it does. Sorry. Um, expect Codemasters obviously would. On the, It's on the front. Features voice synthesis. And this jumped out at me. Uh, yeah, Codemasters artwork's always a little bit cheap. I'm, I've been told they used to knock up their artwork very, very quickly. But it does the job and makes the game leap off the shelf. It does exactly what it says on the tin. The other thing to mention with Codemasters is they always made sure, or they tried to make sure, they had actual screenshots from your system on the back. So Super Robin Hood here says actual Amstrad screenshots, which again is a big selling point because you were seeing what you were going to buy as opposed to trying to guess what system you were looking at. Now good artwork isn't a reason the game should jump off the shelf at you because this is a game that jumped off the shelf at me when I saw it. Actually, this is my mate C64 copy, but I had this on the Amstrad as well, and we both bought this independently without knowing. Cauldron 1 and Cauldron 2 on the same, might have been 2 99 might have been 3 99 can't remember. Tape, two games that you knew were good for the price of one by high tech. Now, you're not even going to start trying to examine other games around, are you, when you see these two on the same tape? And... Really nice marketing there, and of course it's brilliant. It's got the palace. They managed to get the palace software logo on the front as well. Again, another mark of quality. And I don't think I think Barbarian came out on Kicks, didn't it? But this came out on High Tech, and a brilliant idea. I mean, I don't know how it affected their sales, actual figures in pounds compared to releasing the two games independently, but. Um, Really nice, and on the back you get screenshots of the game and high-tech software, who of course went bust, um, who later did lots of original games, but originally did um, re-releases. And look at this. Look. Look at all this here. That's the instructions for Cauldron 1, Cauldron 2, Cauldron 1. It's half written foreign. It's half written different language. Oh, it is. Right, okay. Ah, right, okay. That's Cauldron 1 there. You don't get much, I guess. It, that's probably on an authentically printed bit of paper originally. There's Cauldron 2, and then you've got different languages there. Coming soon, the sacred arm of Antrid. Well, you know, that's another... I don't know, I've seen a copy of that on high tech, but again, I like that. That really works, because you, you're getting the nice artwork originally, and you're getting two games for the price of one. I think that would have been probably been quite high up the charts at the time. Of course, and the final game we're going to look at, you can always put a celebrity on the cover of your game. Imagine a top celebrity on the cover of your game. That's going to make the game jump off the shelf, isn't it, kids? Yeah. It's, uh, well, it's Jimmy Savile, isn't it? Um, this was, Super Trolley was the game featured on Jim Will Fix It where a kid wanted to write a game that says, as seen on the BBC's, BBC TV's Jim Will Fix It. The kid went to the software house, Icon Design, helped them design a game which turned out to be Super Trolley. Um, 
clearly that's Jimmy Savile, although it doesn't actually say it is. They would have had to pay him if they said it was endorsed by Jimmy Savile. Pretty poor drawing of Jimmy Savile. Um, looks like Stu Fran- looks like Stu. I could crush a grape, Francis, doesn't it? Really, as opposed to Savile. Um, and yeah, well, that's got all sorts of connotations today. Um, but even at the time, that wouldn't have made a kid want to buy the game. It's just the sort of master wanting to try and get a bit of publicity off the TV show. Um, yeah, so. And the screenshots on the back look fairly rubbish. Well, I, I, I did like the idea of doing a game in a supermarket. It's quite novel, but the game looks fairly bland. Uh, lots of text. I mean, if a game has to have that much text on the back of it, a budget game, something's wrong. You're trying to oversell it and trying to explain what it's all about. And again, on the back it has, as seen on the BBC TV's, Jim will fix it. So we've looked at a few games that would have appeared on news agent shelves back in the day and a lot of them have nice artwork that would have jumped out at you really i think the few one is a little bit uh more basic but most of these yeah i mean these ones i i've said i've bought except for molecule man when you looked at these games on the shelf you had not seen the reviews the magazines were typically three months behind on reviews so you by the time you saw a review of the game the next batch of games come into the news agent or software shop and you're buying those instead So you really did rely on the artwork and your judgment. And yeah, okay, a lot of the time you got it wrong. But sometimes the artwork like Connolly, like 180, like Werewolves of London, like Scrimes, Spook School, and to an extent The Apprentice really actually did do the majority of the selling of the game to you. And actually did a pretty good job of describing what the game was all about. (laughs) 